Um, really quickly, I, and I'll say this, I posted this, or I will be posting this, I don't know if I have. These are the solutions that we came up with for numbers one, two, three, and four on Thursday, I think is when we shared all these. And so, uh, McKay and Caroline did a good bit. Jeffrey, did I have you put an answer up? Yeah, he did number four. And then, I can't remember, I think that was it. And I, I think I had McKay and uh, Caroline, because they were done early, collaborate on number three. Um, so remember, like, we're going to try to do more stuff like this where you get to get up, you get to move around, you get to put your answers up. But you do have to be working hard and being diligent getting ahead to make sense of these things. Uh, does anyone remember what the point of this task was so far? We're going to recap a good bit. But what were we trying to learn through this task? Um... Like some tables. So we definitely wanted to be practicing creating each of the representations. Notice we've got a tabular, a graphical, and an algebraic for each of these. Um, but there was something a little bit more important to it. So let's look at what that was. Oh, because I had to print that out, I forgot to go back to the slides. Is your thing recording? Yes, it is. So that is another thing to remember. Uh, if you're ever out a day, I post videos from what we did in class each day, so you can go check that. If you go to Schoology, uh, just on the first page of materials, there is a link to every video I've uploaded. I've tried to make it explicit what day the video was on, what we were covering, stuff like that. Um, but you can also just go to the day within the week. Um, so like we're in Unit 3, Linear and Exponential Functions. We just finished Week 12, or on Week 12, so in Week 11, if you go within the day, you can find a link to the video there. So those are things to be aware of to help you out. So we're going to look at the objectives for today, and then we're gonna to try to wrap up 2.1 as much as possible. If we can finish up 2.1, we'll move on to 2.2 after looking at its objectives. Really quickly, I do wanna remind you of this. Why do we look at the objectives for everything? Before we even start today. Um. To know what to have a plan. Okay, partially to have a plan. It's hard to accomplish your plan if you don't know what you're trying to do. Literally, that's what an objective is. I can identify the domain of functions with additive re uh, rates of change and multiplicative rates of change. We're about to get to that point. We didn't get a chance to do that yet. Um, and then we want to be able to differentiate arithmetic sequences from linear functions and geometric sequences from exponential functions. We didn't quite get a chance to wrap that up, but what I do want to point out is we did look at this idea. A sequence is a discrete model. Now we're starting to remember it. Versus the linear and exponential functions, there we go, those were continuous models. So that was kind of what the point of this task was. We still need to talk a good bit about domain and how we might write that domain, but we also really want to recognize and uh, pull on this idea of a discrete versus a continuous model. That's what this task is all about. If you don't know that, then it's hard to learn what you're supposed to learn out of this. So let's look at 2.1, and what we're going to be doing with numbers uh, 5, 6, and 7 is first we were supposed to compare problems 1 and 3, and what similarities do you see? What differences do you notice? Number 6, compare problems 1 and 2, what similarities do you see? What differences? Same thing with number 7 for problems 3 and 4. So here's something I want you to be aware of. I've done these set of lessons or set of tasks in the past, and I've created whole solution sets, and I'm still creating new solution sets for new tasks and things like that, but um, after we complete a task, if you go on to Schoology, and you look inside Unit 3, there's actually a folder that's devoted to solution sets. Not saying that this is the only solution that you could have done, but notice how there's all of this extra notation, right? Note, linear because repeatedly added. It's got an added rate of change, which makes it a linear shape. Right here, explaining this equation, right? We started with five pennies, so P equals five. Repeatedly adding three pennies, 
And multiplication is repeated addition, right? So plus three times D, the number of days. These solutions are on Schoology. I want you to be successful. I want you to have the resources that you need in order to be successful at these things. If this is still not enough, come into tutoring. Five different tutoring sessions each week. And I know some of us don't want to come to tutoring because let's be real. You got to get here early on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or you have to stay late Tuesday, Thursday. It's a drag. However, we've got to overcome some deficiencies, whether it be academic things that we don't know or maybe laziness factors that we have to overcome. Because the two things that you need to really get out of this class and every class in high school are the same two things that every employer wants to see out of you. That you can work hard and that you know how to think. You've got to get both of those things. So we've got to make sure that we're doing both of those in class as well. And outside of class when it's needed. Okay, so again, these solutions are there. We should already have numbers 1, 2, and 3 already in our... Um, one, two, three, and four already in our book. Um, so the first question here was asking us to compare problems one and three. So little sister, sister Savannah is three years old. She has a piggy bank that she wants to fill, and she started with five pennies, and each day when I come home from school, she's excited when I give her three more pennies. That's number one. Here's number three. I'm more sophisticated than my little sister. So I have money. I save my money in a bank account that pays me 3% interest on the money in the account at the end of each month. Right, if I take my money out before the end of the month, I don't earn any interest. So first off, I want you to notice a couple of things. Or first off, I guess I should ask you, we're trying to look at uh, one and three. What similarities do you see? What differences do you see? So here's number one, right? Here's number three. What similarities, what differences do you see between those? Talks about the same thing. Say again? Talks about the same thing. When you say the same thing, what do you mean? Little sister, money. Okay, so it's about, so you're saying the context are similar? Something like that. So money in respect to time. Are there any other similarities? Let's look at a couple of just simple things. Look at my graphs. What do I have on my uh, graphs every time? Labels. Labels. Days and pennies. So similarities, right? Contexts are similar. Labels on axes. Um, I do want you to notice what type of variables are we dealing with on the x-axis? Days, months, time. here we have minutes. Time. Time, right? Yeah, starting back early. Time is my independent variable. And I, I do want you to pay attention to this. Almost every time you deal with time, that's going to be your independent variable. Time continues on, and the things change around it as a result of how the cha time changes, right? Number two, as the minutes go by, I get more gallons in the pool. Number one, as the days go by, the sister gets more pennies, right? Time is almost always going to be our independent variable. Are there any other similarities that we can start to pick up on numbers one and three? You're missing one of the most important ones, to be real. Discrete. Hmm? Discrete. 
Okay, when, when you say discrete, what do you mean by that? So I, I, I see, what do we see in the, the graph? Well, here it's linear, I do agree. But if you actually check here, it's close to a line, but it's like got a little bit of a curve here. We'll talk about why in a second. When you say discrete, what do you mean by that, McKay? Yeah, right here between the dots. Think about this context. If I take my money out before the end of the month, I don't earn any interest. So month zero, she's got $50. Will she have any more money until the end of that month? So is there anything in between these two points? Right? We need to recognize that it is discrete. Well, and let's check number one as well. So, the little sister Savannah is getting three pennies every day. So, is there any point between zero and one days where she has six pennies? Mm -hmm. No. She has five pennies to start, and at the end of day one, she has three more pennies. She doesn't get anything in between there. So, discrete means that the points are isolated. Cannot get anything in between. That's a critical detail that we need to notice. We are legitimately talking about discrete points here. Is that you can't bother writing this down? All right. One thing I would put under this idea of discrete, this is something that came up later uh, when I taught this uh, with my Algebra 1 classes before. We want to recognize that discrete really means, or one way to recognize discrete is anytime you can count something, right? When you're dealing with discrete concepts, that means you're counting something, right? You're counting the pennies. The money is kind of, or the money that you get interest on, that's a little bit different, but usually when it's discrete, it is something you can count. We also want to talk about domain. Y'all should have talked about this in previous math classes. What do I mean by domain? really like to help you here, but I can't. We don't remember anything about domain from Algebra 1. What we? Okay, well let me go ahead and tell you what the domain is here. And let's see if you can tell me where it's coming from. So looking at number 1, the domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, points. 4, 5. Yeah. It's the what? The points. Mm, what about the points? That's how many in between. Mm, look again to see where we can find that one zero one two three four five. The days. That's the days that we're looking at, right? Yeah. Can we see that in the table as well? Yes. Which variable is the days? My independent or my dependent? Dependent. If you think about your science class, you put your dependent variable on the x-axis. Independent. Remember how we earlier identified time is independent. the independent variable? Right? Time is almost always going to be your independent variable. When we talk about domain, what we are looking at is all values for the independent variable. So this is still a similarity. We're going to start looking at some differences in a second. 
But I do want you to make this note because this is going to come up on 2.2 and this is what you need to start doing with 2.2. We don't want to just write 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and then dot, dot, dot. Does anyone know what number system we're dealing with when we say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Do you know what I mean by the number systems? No? Got one no? Anybody else? Not sure? Is it the Dewey Decimal? <laughs> That's a library idea. system? The irrational number system. The rational. Integer. Whole. I might actually remember that. And natural. I do not remember that. You don't remember those things at all? Okay, so if, well, the, I'll show you in a, in a second why I'm doing it this way. If you have never seen these number systems, then you need to find somewhere on that sheet of paper or on a blank sheet of paper to write down these number systems. Let's we'll start with the natural number set. Let me get another piece of paper. Because I'm committed to this class now. Let's go. I just like to hear. I'm about to make it big. Hey, McKay. If you were to start counting, where would you naturally start counting? Zero. Would you really? <laughs> if I went like this, one, two, three, four, five. Right? right? Wouldn't you start counting at one? Yes. The natural number set is numbers one, two, three, so on and so forth. Okay, the natural number set is one, two, three, so on and so forth. Is that a big R or an IR? I can't really tell. That's an R. So te technically, all of these are supposed to have an extra line somewhere. Um, it's called blackboard bold. And the blackboard bold is the symbols that we use for the number sets to separate that, uh, the, that R from just a normal R. And like natural, I know it goes here. I have no clue where it's supposed to go on the W. It's something weird. Okay, so the whole number set, that's actually very, very similar to the naturals. And it's where McKay wants to start counting. So what number would it start at? Zero. One, Zero. Zero. <laughs> one two, three, Five. so on and so forth. Okay, so the natural number set is one, two, three. What's the whole number set is zero, one, two, three. What I want you to notice is the natural number set is within the whole number set. That's why it's below it, right? So the natural number set is completely inside of the whole number set. Okay? Interesting. The integer number set, does anyone have a guess or remember anything about the integers? Decimal. Not quite yet, you're close. Mm. Fractions. That uh, would be part of decimals. Yeah, my bad. Negatives. Not just negatives. Negatives from number three. Negative three to regular three. Well, notice these decimals, or these dot, dot, dots, the ellipses. Oh, that's the end. Same thing on the whole. Okay. So the natural number sets, uh, that's the whole holes without zero. The whole number set starts with zero. So starting with zero, all whole numbers, which means that there is not a part of a number. Um, the integers would be the whole numbers and all of their opposites.
Sorry, I did not think I was going to have to be teaching this, but we're not sure. We got we got to adjust on the fly. No, you're good. I thought we knew what this was, and this is my bad for assuming. I'm still wondering what the Dewey Decimal System has to do with anything. You don't need to worry about it too much, to be real. Like librarians will usually help you out with that. Not bad. When's the last time I've been called a librarian? Fair enough. Middle school. Uh, rational numbers. And, and so something I do want to point out, pretty much all of these letters should make sense, right? N for natural, W for whole, um, yeah, I know. for irrational, R for real. I don't get it. Keywords Z. Keywords Z. That I figured, and that's what I was about to talk about. So first off, I'm actually going to have to remind myself of what it is. I can tell you Z comes from a German word. Not, not zingers. Zollen. Uh, or Zollen, I think, is actually how you pronounce it. Um, all that that is is the German word for number. So, y'all, I assume, have at least heard the term... Ooh, have y'all heard of the term imaginary numbers? Yeah. Yes? So, fun fact. Imaginary numbers are real numbers. But, when they were first discovered, they always assumed, man, there's no way that this could be a real number, so they called it imaginary. Um, in a similar way, the integers, the negatives, were thought to not be a thing. That's why they are negatives. They are things that we didn't like, so we ascribed this negative name to them. right? And I think that it was a German who really pioneered the idea of positive versus negative numbers, which is why we have that Z for integers. And then a rational number, that's where we start to include what numbers they all talked about earlier. Negative. Not decimals. negatives, decimals. Okay? 2.2, uh, 1.3 repeating, 7.5. Now, what most people are unaware of is that the rational numbers Either the decimal has to terminate or the decimal has to repeat. The reason why is because when we talk about the rational numbers, we're talking about a ratio. Specifically, if you look at 2.2, that would be 11 fifths. 1.3 repeating would be 4 thirds. 7.5 would be 15 halves. Notice how each of these decimals, when it terminates or when it repeats, it can be written as what kind of number? Decimal. Fraction. As a fraction. Which a fraction is a ratio of whole numbers. The reason why I'm going through all these hoops to get you there is that word, that Q there, the Q is just for quotient. Isn't that ratio just a division or a quotient of two whole numbers? I don't know that word. A quotient is just division. Yeah. The quotient is the result of division. Yep. Yeah, divisor, dividend quotient. Yeah, so 7.5. So that Q quotient uh, is tying into the idea of ratio for rational numbers. That's why it's a Q. So a rational number, it includes my decimals, but the bigger thing is it's a ratio of two whole numbers or integers. So as a decimal, the decimal terminates or repeats. Okay? And I am letting you know now, knowing that we did not know about these number systems, they will start to show up in understanding checks. Just identifying what number systems some of them fall into. All right? So irrational numbers, those are 
Well, first off, you know what the prefix ear means? Uh, negative. No. Not negative. But if we got rationals, there are things that would not be rational, right? Mm -hmm. So the prefix ear just means not. Not rational. And so the not rational numbers would be things like pi. Or the number e. Or the square root of 5. Or x. Or the square root, not x, that's not a number. It's a variable. E's not a number. E's not a number. Actually, the number e was developed by Leonard Euler. If that's a number, I'm giving up. It, it is a number. Oh so I have a number in my name. Skinny what? So I have a number in my name. No. Uh, Leonard Euler, <laughs> if you actually, um, that might be misspelled, but if you actually look at the Instagram handle for this class, Kenny's Rising Eulers, Leonard Euler is one of the most famous mathematicians, developed a lot of really important concepts like functions and things like that, and so E, yes, okay. you what? <laughs> Kenny's Einstein. Well, Einstein pioneered more things inside the world of physics than mathematics, which ties into mathematics, but Leonard Euler, I almost did uh, New Newtons or Newtonians or something like that. I'm not a Newton. Is. I'm, huh? I'm not a Newton. Is. You yeah, he, well, he developed calculus at the same time as developing um, his concepts of physics. That's why he actually developed calculus, was to make sense of everything in physics. But um, Euler, right, that E is where that, that's where that E came from. But yeah, the E is a, a number, just like pi. Y'all know pi is just a Greek letter, right? Yeah. So pi is a 3.14159, da 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 da, right? In, in the world of science, you have lots of other numbers that are letters. H is Planck's constant. I don't remember what it stands for, but it's some kind of constant number. Most of these things, though, or what we want to recognize about all the irrational numbers is that the decimals do not terminate or repeat. So the decimals just keep on going? Mm-hmm. So there are infinitely many decimals, and it never terminates, and it never repeats. I know. Good job. Wait, what? What? You said it never repeats. Mm-hmm. You mean like no number of repeats? So like, if you look at the number, let's go with one sixth. That's zero point one six repeating. So notice how that six repeats for forever. If you look at something wild like one seventh, notice that's a fraction. So at some point, the decimal is either going to terminate or it's going to repeat, right? If you look at it in a calculator, though, usually all you will see is this. So does it look like anything's repeating yet? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But if you look further, it becomes and so notice and it keeps going exactly like that. So those six numbers keep repeating for all of eternity. The number or the fraction one eleventh is 0 0.090909 and so it's not saying that the same number doesn't ever show up because obviously there's only 10 digits 0 through 9 but when we say the ter decimal repeats we're saying that that same combination of numbers repeats at some point right so 0 9 0 9 0 9 okay but these square roots and pi and e and some other special ones that's where we find our irrational numbers most of the time. And then, if we put together all the irrationals, all the rationals, we get all the reals. Which, that's a whole lot. But, notice the reals cover the integers, they cover the whole numbers, they cover every decimal, every fraction, every radical that you can think of. The only thing it doesn't cover is the imaginary numbers, which we'll actually probably hopefully hit on at some point this year. Say again? What are those? Um... That's a good question. I can go ahead and slightly explain it. What's the square root of 4? 2. Okay, why is it 2? Because it's half of it. But it's not the 3. 
Okay. Remember, half and division, that's the inverse of multiplication. This is a lot to take in. I know. We don't have to know all of this, but square root of 4 is 2 because 2 squared is 4. Right? The inverse of a square root is a square. Right? Okay. So what is the square root of negative 4? Negative 2. Not 2. If I square 2, what does it get me? 4. If I square a negative 2, what does it get me? 4. It also gets me a 4. So there's this issue of how do we deal with a negative inside of the square root? Oh, it's an error on the calculator. It is an error on the calculator, but there is actually a way to deal with it. So what we have done is we've defined the square root of negative 1 as the number i. And so what we would do here is we would split this up as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 4. So that is the square root of negative 4 right there. And so I'm going to deal with that square root of negative 1 as an i. The square root of 4 is 2. So that's 2i. That's an imaginary number. Really mind blowing it. So. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty tricky and pretty cool. Yeah. Wish I'd be able to remember that. Well, so here's the thing. Like I've been dealing with this for I don't know, 15 years now. Some about somewhere around, somewhere around there. Um, you know, I, mean, I studied this in high school and I studied it more in college because, well, in my grad school, as I learned more about mathematics to be a teacher. Um, so you get there. It's not something that I just learned overnight. That's what a lot of people forget about teachers. We should know this because we've been teaching it and learning about it for years. This isn't something you just learn overnight. You have to spend time exploring it, things like that. So we are not going to be able to finish this. We still have like 10 minutes, so we're going to get as much done as we can. But I want you all to notice something about what I did here. If you have questions that are productive and mathematical, ask them. I'm more than happy to derail what I'm doing to feed your interest and to go deeper into a concept that I had no interest in, or no plans to do, right? I had no plans to talk about the number sets. I had no plans to talk about imaginary numbers or anything like that. But if you ask a question, I'm more than happy to cover. Okay? I feel like I've learned a lot more like this too, though. Yeah, because you're asking questions. When you ask the questions, when you drive the instruction, you're more invested, right? So I have a plan of, hey, I want to cover this thing, but like, if you think of a mathematical question, Bet, let's go for it. Okay? Okay, so all that being done and said, let's talk about this a little bit more. So when we're looking at similarities for numbers one and three, what kind of numbers are we dealing with here? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, those are whole, whole numbers. Whole numbers, right? So instead of writing it this way the whole time, what we're going to do is we're still going to use these curly brackets. Anytime you see curly brackets, that's just a set of numbers. And so what we're going to say here is that the domain, put dots just to, well, first off, do you all know what the colon is, is in the English language? Mm, no. A separator? It is kind of a separator. Don't you all usually see a colon maybe at, uh, before a list of something? Uh, yes. Okay, so, but a colon can actually come uh, before a single word or an entire sentence. You also usually see colons um, in dictionaries. Because whatever comes after a colon clarifies, defines, or explains what came before it. So I have domain. Do you know what the domain is yet? No. So now I'm about to define the domain. That's what that colon is there for. So the domain is the set of x when x is an element of the whole numbers. So let me write this out, and I want you to write this down so that you have a record of how this works, like what this set notation is. This is read as the set of x when... Notice that little vertical line there is the idea of when. So it's the set of x when x is an element of the whole number system. Hmm. 
Anyone want to take a shot in the dark and guess what symbol stands for is an element of? That funky looking E little thing. Yep. Right? Mathematicians are not original. If it looks like that would make sense, that is what it is. Um, all that you do to make this symbol for the element of, put a C and then a line through the middle. It is closer to an E, but that's how I always create it. It's a little C with a line through the middle. Okay, so I tried to break that down. Does anyone have any questions about this breakdown of how, how to read this notation? We good? Can I erase this number system stuff? Do we all have this down? Yeah. So notice those are all the similarities, at least the ones that I would note here. What differences should we note? So we're still looking at numbers one and three. What differences should we note? Maybe look at the graph, maybe look at the table, maybe look at the equation. One's adding. Is this one adding? None. Can you go no. back to the other one real quick? And then one's multiplying. Oh, never mind, I'll go. So one's arithmetic and one's geometric. Okay, so what do you think this one is? Arithmetic or geometric? Geometric. Okay, so number three is geometric. Hmm. What told you is geometric? Multiply by one point Okay, so multiplying by 1.03 each month. So, because at a multiplicative rate of change. Which is why I knew if I look a little bit closer at this or go a little bit further, it's not a line, it's a curve, right? It's got to be curving if it's that geometric sequence. But I want to ask this question because this is a really important detail. Because this is a detail that most of us are missing when it comes to understanding checks. Where in the world did this 1.03 come from? Um, but that's only 3%. And that's what a lot of y'all focus on. He, had, he started with the 100%, then you added the 3%. I need y'all to focus on this detail. If that bank account pays me 3% interest on the money in the account, we need to recognize that I start out with all of my money, right? I'm not letting them take that away from me. So all of my money, all of my everything is 100%. That's true every time. We're dealing with 100% to start, and then we're increasing it by 3%. So at each month, we have 103% of the previous. We need to recognize how we get from that 3% to the correct overall percentage. And we've talked about this pretty regularly at this point. Because most of us are good at this part. If it's a percent of, what are we doing? Multiplying. Anytime it's a percent of, we're multiplying. Specifically, we need to rewrite this percent as a decimal. decimal. So we're multiplying by... We're repeatedly multiplying by 1.03. That's how I got this common ratio. Right? That common ratio right, is my multiplicative rate of change. All right. So we talked about similarities. We're going to wrap up these differences here. Uh, geometric multiplicative rate of change common ratio is 1.03, which one of the biggest things to notice here is that the number of dollars in the account is 50, what do we do with the common ratio? We repeatedly multiply. multiply. So we're multiplying by 1.03. How do we show repeated multiplication? Exponent. An exponent. 
And it's got to be that variable months to account for the different months in this case. Any questions about that? We good? And the way that contrasts with number one is that while number three is geometric, number one was arithmetic. Notice how it's got a linear shape there. And all of that is being created because what type of rate of change is it? Multi, I mean, I mean, common difference. It's common difference, which additive. is an additive rate of change. Remember that common difference, that's the same thing as a slope, an additive rate of change. What are we repeatedly adding? Three. And that shows up in the equation that the pennies are equal to five plus three times D, right? Start off with five pennies, just like we start off with $50. Then here we're multiplying repeatedly, so we had an exponent. Here we're adding repeatedly, so we have multiplication. Those are our differences, those are our similarities. Any questions at that point? Okay. So we do not have time to go further. But we need to wrap this up tomorrow 100%. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Nope, I need homework. I need you to actually do number six and seven tonight. Um, so I need you to do, or ignore this homework. I'll adjust it on Schoology. All right, so 2.1 numbers 6 and 7, and then I need you to do arithmetic means and geometric means. That was from 1.9 and 1.10. So y'all remember that vocab sheet that I gave y'all? Looks like this. I know you can have this one, Gavin. Okay, so this vocab sheet, I need you to define arithmetic means and geometric means before you come to class tomorrow, and I need you to do 2.1, number 6 and 7. Um, we good? No, this, uh, these slides are already up, so you can actually see the solutions for numbers 1 through 4 to help you if you don't have the solutions for those. Let me quickly spray the desk. Today, can you make sure everyone gets paper towel? Thank you, sir. Gavin? Here you go, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's still cold in here. I'm sorry you feel that way. I disagree wholeheartedly, but. Thank everyone. You think everyone what? I think she's the only one like that in here.